Nonsense. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. All right. I'm ready to dive in. All right. Great. Who are you? I'm Brother Dan. I'm Sister Lisa. And this is Siblings in Zion. And we are back to talk some more about the notes Sister Lisa took in her classes. For anyone who really enjoyed the last episode, you are going to be thrilled. (laughs) Because it's just more of that. From the prestigious institution known as Brigham Young University dash Idaho. So prestigious. Prestigious. Okay. I love telling people I went to school at BYU Idaho. Okay. I love it. Just kidding. I do everything I can to avoid it. Who? Because if you know anything about that. Yeah. It doesn't there's, look good. There's preconceived notions about it, yeah. For sure. Depending on who you are. Could be good or bad. Yep. If you're not Mormon, probably not super impressive. No. <laughs> Idaho? Oh, They have a of, university in Idaho? You're one of those people. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah, right. Oh. Mm, I know everything I need to know about <laughs> you. Hmm. Again, good or bad. You ready? Yeah, are you? Yeah. Lay it on me. I couldn't be more ready. So let's be clear again. Be clear. These notes are primarily not what you are saying to yourself, but yeah. what you captured from the lessons, presentations of your quote unquote professors. Quote unquote. At BYU Idaho. Yeah. Okay. Although the first thing I have here is Something I wrote for a class assignment. Oh, okay. Do you want to start with that? Or sure, save yeah, it? no. Okay. Great. This is called Personal Revelation. And I believe it's for that class where we talked about basically dating. It was like mm. a three-credit class about dating and how to get married. Temple marriage prep? Yeah. Yeah. Family prep. Oh, boy. That was astonishing. Yeah. <laughs> You're about to be dazzled even more. Ready? Okay, let's okay. do it. Okay. This is called Personal Revelation, written on May 10th, 2015. Okay. Well. By yours truly. And I got an A. So. Oh, good job. Yeah. One of my favorite scriptures is found in 1 Nephi 13, verse 12, which says, And I looked and beheld a man among the Gentiles who was separated from the seed of my brethren by the many waters. And I beheld the Spirit of God that it came down and wrought upon the man, and he went forth upon the many waters, even unto the seed of my brethren. Who were in the promised land. Okay. Many waters. Many. Many. The word wrought Mm -hmm. is a synonym for the word work. One of its definitions is activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result. My teacher highlighted the word wrought and drew a heart next to it. Likes that one. Yeah. This description is fairly accurate according to my perception of the way the spirit works Mm. with me. It often starts as a small thought in the back of my mind. (laughs) However, the more I try to ignore the thought, the stronger it becomes. I try to eagerly act on the promptings I receive, but if it's something big, parentheses, like Christopher Columbus embarking to cross an entire ocean, then he really has to work (laughs) with me for a while. What? If it's going to be that gigantic... (sighs) Because as we all know, Christopher Columbus was inspired by God. Absolutely. To embark on that voyage Mm -hmm. in 1492, where he thought he was sailing to China and had just happened upon the Americas. I should know that, but I don't think he Was it India or China? Did I think it was India. But I don't think he actually did discover these United States. No, he landed in like the Bahamas or something? It's a story that has uh, been modified to fit a narrative much much like hmm. many stories we've we've heard to glorify a man who wasn't really all that great interesting Turns parallels out, there was an episode on the podcast we've talked about called everywhere you go is bullshit formerly known as the fundamentals in which you covered that very man Christopher mm-hmm. Columbus mm-hmm. it'll be in the show notes it's great for some reason i really thought that that was such a great metaphor for revelation yeah. as a Mormon? Well, doesn't Nephi mention, refers to a person mm-hmm. who we, we assume to be Christopher Columbus? Yes. Yeah. Who Who is, that's the scripture I was right. quoting when I started. Okay. Because you think you know one thing and then God actually has a different plan for yeah. you. Like Christopher Columbus landed on a completely different 
continent yeah. than he thought he would. So I was like, oh, we're all like Christopher Columbus. When we receive revelation, we like go towards something, but then we're surprised by what God actually has in store for us. Like what his plan is mm-hmm. for us versus what we think our plan is for us. Yeah, but we do have completely free agency. But completely free. We are the most vulnerable to counterfeit revelation. Fake, not really the will of God. When we want our plans to go through more than we want God's plan to be fulfilled. Uh, Of course. If we ignore his guidance and insist on having it our way, sooner or later, we see why he was instructing us differently in the first place. The times when I receive the clearest revelation from God is when I first humble myself. (laughs) Fasting opens the spiritual channel ever wider. And when I pray with a question and open up my scriptures to find an answer, it is there every time. When we have real intent, we can receive real revelation. Real intent implies that we are really willing to act on the answer we receive, whatever that may be and whether we like it or not. If we have real intent. Real intent. As in, if we really give up our intuition. Exactly. Our our personal If you just give up and accept that the things that we're being told from our institutional leaders are the right thing to do. Exactly. Now you're getting it. Like when you decided not to go on a mission or to go to the school that was not BYU-Idaho. Yeah. We had to just give in and, and trust that your betters were correct. Exactly. Okay, I'll throw some stuff out there and you say, tell me more or move on. Okay. (laughs) Question, how does a lack of understanding about real love and a lack of knowledge about the doctrine of revelation leave us vulnerable to the influence of the adversary? Ooh. Okay, this is interesting because I was just listening to the latest Mormon Stories episode Mm. featuring John Larson. Mm. He was talking about the character of Satan. Oh, and his okay. many versions in the old scriptures and Joseph Smith's scriptures, you know. Yeah. And who is the adversary? Satan. Right. But in the scriptures, it actually describes different things that are attributed to mm, the mm-hmm. adversary. Yeah, his roles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the tempter. It, it comes back to something that, that I think that we've talked about many times. Like the character of Satan and Lucifer, the adversary, is mm-hmm. so nebulous. The changes to fit different situations and narratives. Mm-hmm. And it's just... That's true. It, whatever is in opposition to what church leaders are trying to convey at the time. Yeah. Whatever is adverse to paying your tithing reading your scriptures, paying your tithing. <laughs> oh, wait, paying your tithing? Did Getting we mention that? in the that? temple and then paying your tithing and right. making kids who will pay your tithing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, give me more of that. Great, perfect. God is always more powerful than Satan, but Satan does try to interfere with our seeking revelation from God. Yeah. He does seem to have a whole lot of mm-hmm. power and influence. Mm-hmm. Now, remember, this is a class about dating. So the answer starts Uh with anytime hormones are involved, we are vulnerable. Okay. So where would... Okay. So at the time, where would you think... Who's who's responsible for the hormonal balance? You are. I am? Mm -hmm. The natural man is an enemy to God, Daniel. You mean my reaction to the hormonal action? I can't control my hormones. No, just your whole body. Is an enemy to God, your natural state. The thing that he created. Yeah. Anytime two people are involved, they both need a yes for revelation, a yes to get married. Uh-huh. If I'm really at peace, why do I keep praying the same prayer? Uh-huh. Is this the person I should marry? Is this the person is I should marry? Really, is this the person that I should marry? How can we get experience with personal revelation? You can have what you want, and that will be nice. Or you can <laughs> trust the Lord and have something better. Oh. Yeah. Even if it doesn't feel like it's what you want. hmm Okay, these are the principles of revelation. Are you ready? Yeah. There's eight of them. Oh, geez. You don't get revelation for others. The Lord doesn't take away our agency. The Lord doesn't inspire you to break commandments. 
Watch out for pride. Look out. Don't manipulate with revelation. Have some experience. Be obedient and have real intent. Have real intent? Mm Mm-hmm. What qualifies as real intent? Remember that scripture at the end of the Book of Mormon where he's like, and if mm-hmm. you pray having real intent, then the truth of what they say mm-hmm. is what he's trying to do. Like I said, real intent is, will do you intend to act on the answer you receive? Uh-huh. Whether you want but, to or not. What if you don't receive the answer that is in the affirmative, as in praying as to whether or not the Book of Mormon is quote unquote true? Then the lack of answer is that you knew all along. You didn't need to get another answer. What if you get the the answer that it's not true? Then you didn't have real intent is the implication. Yes. Bullshit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a only merry one right go answer. round of yeah. bullshit. How can we know our promptings are the real deal? Wait, sorry. The second one that you read, what was that again? You don't get revelations for others. Now, I would Revelation th- for others. I would think that many members of the church would kind of scoff at that yep. or at least recoil because mm-hmm. they sure do like to share their mm-hmm. own revelation about you. Mm-hmm. Sure have do. we not both? Have we not? Yeah. Yeah. Experienced that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Where does that come from? My teacher. Right. Do you know where they're getting that from? No. <laughs> Under what authority? <laughs> I mean... At least... At least She's I would talking recognize, about like the question of who to marry. At least I would recognize that that is in this context a healthy thing to set forth. And right. that you don't need to give deference to the man that their revelation yeah. is for you. Right. I had that a revelation. You're supposed to marry me. Yeah. Because we know <laughs> we've this has been a problem before. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound familiar at all. Yeah. I could appreciate that. Yeah. Seems slightly less manipulative. Mm-hmm. What can we do to enhance our ability to hear and recognize the voice of the Lord? Why is this so hard? It only gets into our soul if we work for it. There's a lot of onus on a person to just stop thinking for themselves. And after all that, the next <laughs> note is, it's not as much about receiving revelation as much as it is about doing your homework and being an agent that acts. Okay. What really makes a person beautiful? Your soul. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, all, that's all you need. <laughs> that's why they're telling you to wear makeup as a sister missionary uh-huh. on your mission. Why not put a little makeup on? A why little, not? A little lipstick. Mm-hmm. A little rouge. Mm-hmm. One set of earrings. Yes. No more. No more. No less. You're going to end up with a real human with real flaws who had the audacity to age. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Why do you think you wrote that down? Because my teacher said it. <laughs> and that's about it? I think she was trying, like, she was talking about how you need to be attractive, but why are we so obsessed with appearances if we're all going to age? Uh-huh. And what really makes you beautiful? Your soul. Uh-huh. And Johnny Lingo. That stupid right. movie. Oh, man, it is a dumb... There's a quote that says, many things can happen to make a woman beautiful. The most important is what she thinks of herself. Yeah, you want an eight cow woman. So if you're constantly worrying about your appearance and bullying yourself, then you're not going to be very beautiful because you'll be so mm-hmm. down on yourself. It's eight cows, right? Yeah. That's the trait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Johnny Lingo. A quality date. There are three... Facets. Okay. Quality date is planned, paired off, and paid for. Paired off. Like it should be a one on one date, not a group date. In college. But before that, you're encouraged to do group dates. Yeah. Paid for. Yeah. The guy should pay for it. Of course. Mm -hmm. When you're on a date, you need to be looking for evidence of maturity, unselfishness, and commitment to the gospel. And then she she gave us tips on how to look for each of those things. Okay. You want to know how... Please. To find out if he's mature. Yeah. How seriously do they take school? Okay. Well, what's interesting about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and their approach to education is that it is encouraged, and the whole 
BYU school system, where as it's de-emphasized and sometimes discouraged in other mm. similar mm-hmm. religious mm. groups like mm. Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. They really don't want you to be all that educated. They would encourage you to do something like a trade, yeah, like plumbing or something like, like that. Right. College is often de-emphasized and discouraged. I mean, you are supposed to have to make a living, but in that specific group, you're also expected to do a lot of proselytization as a lay member, not yeah. just a missionary. Right. You're encouraged to go out door to door, no matter I who you are. I see them all the time. Yeah. Or stand there with your brochures on the, on the side of the street. Right. I just think of that organization in particular where yeah. education is not... Not a priority. No. That makes sense. So that is interesting and commendable, I guess. Yeah. The other one is... What do they laugh at? Okay. It's the other thing but to look for. what is the right answer for that? I guess it's up to you. Yeah. Unselfishness. How does he treat other people, people he cannot benefit from? So like the server or something. Uh-huh. Someone you don't really need mm-hmm. to be nice to. And commitment to the gospel. For some reason, the note is divorce rate drops to 3%. She's saying that if you actually are living the gospel, then you won't get divorced. How do you get that stat? 3%? Yeah. I mean, I think in comparison with the general population, divorce rates in the church are less, but 3%? If you're living the gospel correctly? If. I'd I'd like to see uh, documentation on that. Thanks. Thank you. Statistics, please. Okay, so because BYU-Idaho is on a track system, Mm -hmm. the track system is everyone's off during summer and there is fall, winter, spring. Mm -hmm. Some people are there fall, winter. Some people are there winter, spring. Mm -hmm. Some people are there spring, fall. Okay. So it can feel like if you're in different tracks with someone and you start dating, that dating is a marriage proposal. Oh, Because you have to figure it out before you both leave. Yeah. Like you're on a time crunch. Mm -hmm. But my teacher is saying, it's not a marriage proposal, (laughs) but it's really hard to get a a feel for someone on the first date. And we don't want to waste time. No. But we're in such a rush. So if like the first date doesn't go well, then you're just like on to the next person because I only have this many weeks right. to find my eternal companion. Yeah. <laughs> it has to happen here and now. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is where it's supposed to happen. Right. And so she's saying like, BYU doesn't hold a candle to the strange and bizarre dating rituals of BYU-Idaho because BYU doesn't have the track system. Oh. So this kind of okay. feeds into the three-month engagement yeah. situations you find at BYU-Idaho. So she's saying ignore the crazy. Yeah. It is what it is. Well, so far, I'm not as appalled. Yeah, it's a little better. Oh, she's saying think of this person like a roll of pennies. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) There's a new piece of information with every penny. Oh, no, that's a dating. That's a date idea. Have a roll of pennies and then go to a fountain and then like throw in a penny Uh for everything you tell that person. (laughs) <laughs> and this fountain is located on BYU-Idaho campus? The frozen tundra of where southeastern they can Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> where they can um, use a fine sieve. Yeah. <laughs> a sieve. Ah, pennies. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So these are the percentages for... I don't even know what to call this. She's saying common ground... 80% of the football field you plow together. What? 80, 80% of your relationship should be like mutual. The football field? <laughs> <laughs> then 10% is yours and 10% is his. And you respect each other's individuality, but also venture to their side and see what that's like. Uh-huh. Have Very a wi- specific analogy. Uh-huh. Have a willingness to try and never put each other down. You want... 
your personality and values to match, there's a lot of room for differences in interests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Red flags in relationships and personality styles. Oh, okay. So like when we hide our like bad qualities in dating, we're making ourselves into a Christmas tree. We put our flat side to the wall. Like you hide the part no one wants to see. (laughs) Wow. Interesting. Dating is a game played on the grounds of mutual deception. Oh. Uh, (laughs) Oh. 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 Okay. I mean, that's not wrong. It's not entirely wrong. The way a lot of people do it. Right. The way a lot of people do it. Yeah. Yeah. The way most people do it. Mm Mm-hmm. You're looking for the really good stuff, but you're, you've got to pay attention to the really dangerous stuff, too. Well, yeah. You need hardcore evidence that this is the right choice. Okay, okay. We're getting into what is a red flag. Okay. And when you should stop. Okay. Manipulation, controlling, and signs of abuse. Manipulation is more subtle and controlling is more obvious, but there's a spectrum from mild to severe. And you aren't going to see the severe, so look for patterns of mild. Okay. In the dating stage. Is this professor, Hmm. is that an appropriate even term? I should probably adjunct. I don't even know. Is this different than the one This is the same person. This is the same person with the temple marriage prep. Yeah. Then why am I finding myself so- (laughs) I know. Much less. Remember, because there are sprinkles of, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then sprinkles of, I'm sorry, what did you just say? And that sounds ridiculous to a degree that I am perplexed. Mm-hmm. But yeah, most of this I could appreciate. I know. I'm sure we'll get there. Okay. So red flags of the mild sort are shallow commitment to the gospel. Okay. Yeah. Being passive aggressive. And they're being pressured to decide now. If your family doesn't like him, he's moody or over-emotional. He pushes boundaries physically. Money spending habits. Bad boy. Entitled. (laughs) High maintenance. Self-centered. Different goals. Ideals and values. Secretive or deceitful. But passive aggressive. I mean, that's just kind of Mormon culture. Yeah. Well, so is self-centered. Yeah. Especially for a young man. They're imbued with this sense of entitlement and kind of uh, overblown sense of responsibility True. for other people via the priesthood. Oh, she's teaching us about personality styles. Active dependent, passive dependent, narcissistic, avoidant, passive aggressive, and schizoid. That is not how that works. <laughs> No. Oh, yeah, that's wrong. That's garbage information. (laughs) Into the trash. Discussion question. One, when does kissing cross the boundary? (laughs) Yeah, when does it? (laughs) Is it too many kisses? (laughs) Is it where you kiss? When your hormones get bumped up that high, you cease to be able to think that clearly high. when you're kissing. Motivation is everything. Any kiss is a rush. Your body is wired to respond to that. So do not kiss in a series. <laughs> a series Set of a kisses. timer. Okay, it's been 30 right, seconds. Stop, 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 you manage that it will never go too far. The girl who nickmos is the girl who will withhold sex after marriage because she has learned to use sexuality as manipulation. Ooh. Wow. Okay, so explain nickmo. Non-committal, Non-committal committal makeout? makeout? Yeah. So she's saying that the girl who makes out with people now is going to m- use sex as a tool of manipulation later. Very presumptuous. Wow. 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 The breakup will be terrible if you let the physical stuff get in the way. Terrible. Statistics show that couples who hold back enjoy their sex life more. (laughs) 
<laughs> Maybe for a brief period when all of that restricted excitement gets mm-hmm. spent. Should you divulge your past? <laughs> Wait until it looks eternal. Uh, past of what? Sexual sin. Oof. If it affects both of you. The best way out of a sexual addiction is to be open about it. Probably pretty inaccurate definition of what sex addiction is. Right. Garbage. Guys rules? Yeah, let's have it. It seems like we always hear the rules from the female side. Finally, some guy has taken time to write down the guy side of the story. Finally. Finally. Jeez. I don't like the looks of this. <laughs> you don't remember this? There's 25 of them. Oh my goodness. What? All is this, of which we is will this gladly rule? share with you now. Is this rules? Oh my God. Where does this come from? I think this is a joke. This is a joke. This must be a joke. This teacher gave us this handout. And I think it's satire. Is that the right word? Uh Uh-huh. And it's 25 rules for like what women would probably tell men. But it's their response to those rules. Okay. Let me give you an example. Let's see. Learn to work the toilet seat. You're a big girl. If it's up, put it down. We need it up. You need it down. You don't hear us complaining about you leaving it down. Oh, boy. Yeah. This is what we're working with. (laughs) Two, Sunday sports. It's like the full moon or the changing of the tides. Let it be. (laughs) Three, shopping is not a sport. And no, we are never going to think of it that way. Four, crying is blackmail? What is happening? What is this? Five, ask for what you want. Let us be clear on this one. Subtle hints do not work. Strong hints do not work. Obvious hints do not work. Just say it. Six, yes and no are perfectly acceptable answers to almost every question. Seven, come to us with a problem only if you want help solving it. That's what we do. Sympathy (laughs) is what your girlfriends are for. That's what we do. Eight, a headache that lasts for 17 months is a problem. See a doctor. What? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Nine, anything we said six months ago is inadmissible in an argument. In fact, all comments become null and void after seven days. Ten, it's not, if it's not fair for us to expect you to dress like the Victoria's Secret girls, it's not fair for you to expect us to act like the chick flick guys. The, okay, what, what is this? What is this? I don't understand why our teacher gave us this handout. You have enough clothes. You have too many shoes. I am in shape. Round is a shape. What? We, we're moving on. Round is a shape. <laughs> I wrote in relation to a discussion about pornography. Uh-huh. This is a massive, huge, explosive problem. <laughs> <laughs> my god i mean the three of those things <laughs> capitalized by explosive <laughs> incredible oh wow we need to be the ones to climb our way out of this mess <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> oh jesus <laughs> christ we're covered in this explosive <laughs> mess <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, shit, man. There's something called the compulsive cycle. And what is that exactly? Oh, uh, it's a... Pornography is a dysfunctional emotional problem. So we're learning about the cycle of shame. Oh, boy. Yeah. Although I really felt seen when we went over that shame cycle because that's what my whole upbringing was like. Mm -hmm. It was like doing something the church tells you not to do and then feeling horrible for it. Yeah. And then feeling like you can't talk about it. So then you just feel worse and more isolated. And then the cycle just keeps mm-hmm. continuing. Mm-hmm. Only then I told myself it was my fault. Yeah. Oh, when should you call an engagement off? If they cheat on you, look for the pattern in the red flags. If it's a one-time thing, it's okay. It's not a reflection of normality at all. If you can make a list, then you can talk. If it's just general anxiety, then that's exactly what it is. If you 
if you're calmed every time you're around him, then it's okay. That's fine. Wedding day. Finally. She gave us a whole rundown about what to do on the wedding day. Such as? Sit and meet with the recorder and go over the paperwork. Like getting your tempo recommends and the rings. Talk with the ordinance worker. How to like get around the bride's room in the temple. <sighs> what kind of dress to wear. It says it's about your countenance. <laughs> Stay close to the Lord and you will be beautiful. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. The celestial room on the other side of the veil. The ceiling room. I've only been to one ceiling. And it is weird because when you're there for a temple ceiling, they are in their temple clothes, the people getting married. Mm -hmm. But everyone else watching is in their church clothes. You're not all in temple clothes, which is weird. Oh, advice about sex. Oh, here we go. After the wedding. Which is the first time, obviously, it's going to be happening. Yeah. But I'm nervous, but I'm inexperienced. What are realistic expectations? What should the boundaries be? What about birth control? Advice to men, advice to girls, other questions. Ooh. Oh, God. Oh, boy. There's nothing to be worried or nervous about. All you have to do is start kissing. And this time you don't need to stop kissing. Interesting. All you, I remember her saying, all you have to do is kiss and your body will know how to do the rest. That is it. What an interesting like primer that they've been setting up about like kissing is, it's how it starts and you better stop it. But then once, once you're married, then you, you don't have to you stop let it rip. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Again, that is kind of true. Sure, but. What if you're marrying someone that you don't actually feel attracted to? Your body's not going to know what to do in that case. That's, yeah, that's right. And that's where the and unfortunate... You exactly, you wouldn't if you've know. If you've stopped yourself from letting things, letting your hormones progress in a way that they naturally would, if you really were attracted to someone. Yeah. I didn't even examine that. That it is possible that it actually doesn't go farther. Yeah. And uh, and then you're married for eternity. Wow. So figure it out. <laughs> you're going to become experienced together is the response to, <laughs> but I'm inexperienced. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay. What are realistic expectations? It might not be perfect. We put so much emphasis on sexuality. Is the answer to that. Uh -huh. Okay. What should the boundaries be? Keep it behind closed doors. Don't talk about it. Anytime it's selfish, it won't be good. Figure it out. Did he cross a boundary? Did we do something wrong? If it feels wrong, it is wrong. Positions is for you two to figure it out. Think of it as good and right, and you will know what is good and right. Your focus should be on your spouse. The more unselfish you are, the better your sex life is. Sexuality is a great place to practice unselfishness. Listen to your conscience. Well, selfishness is one thing, but... like, But to never... But to, to always be thinking about what yeah. they want and never expressing what you yeah. do. How would you know if you're being selfish or not? Exactly. And don't talk about it to anyone. <laughs> it's terrible. As soon as you get engaged, go see, a, go see a doctor. Go see a doctor about what? Birth control. Oh. Men are like microwaves. Women are like crockpots. That's what I took away from this class. Explain that. <laughs> Men can like turn on uh -huh. and be ready to go. Women need time to warm up. That's, that, that is not a scientific fact. I mean. I, I'm sure of you know that according by According to her, <laughs> yeah. it is because she said it takes men five to seven minutes to reach climax. It takes 20 for women. I mean, that's... Uh, uh, I, I, no. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about your husband exactly. and your one experience. Exactly. Yikes. When you've had sex three to four times a week for 10 years, then you're experienced. 
there is no way. <laughs> There's no way that that is the norm for anyone. Three to four times a week for 10 years. 10 years. That's not, that doesn't happen. But it's on her calendar, remember? Tw- at least 20 minutes per session. Uh huh. Yeah. But that stops. <laughs> <laughs> Long before 10 years. The more morally clean you are, usually those kids have the better experience. Oh, God. What the fuck? What does that mean? Uh, How does that mean anything? The the more pure you are, the less sexual activity you've been engaged in before you get married. The, the better time you have, I guess. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> Don't go to your parent behind your spouse's back. Go to your bishop. No. No. <laughs> oh my god. No. Why would you want to share that information with your bishop before? Because he's a judge in Israel. Okay. He's who? Who? Brother knows, Dan. Who knows what he is? Really? Oh no. Because as we've seen many times, especially lately, bishops can be. Just as creepy and criminal as anyone, especially when they are privy to all this information. Yeah. And the psyches of these people. Is sex on Sunday appropriate, though? Great question. (laughs) What if I don't like sex? What happens after sex? Is it awkward? Will I be embarrassed? Please tell me. Please. Questions to consider. Neil Maxwell, let us once and for all establish our residence in Zion and give up the summer cottage in Babylon. (laughs) Apparently, I wrote a paper on fidelity. Oh, did you? Did you get an A? Yep, sure did. Obviously. Yep. Wow. There are seven early warning signs that a post-marriage relationship with a member of the opposite sex is inappropriate. One, if you're withdrawing from your spouse. Two, you're hiding communications with your friend from your spouse. Three, you are preoccupied with and daydreaming about your friend. Four, you're sharing thoughts, feelings, and problems with your online friend instead of your spouse. Five, your online friend seems to understand you better than your spouse does. You find yourself anticipating when you can communicate with or be with your online friend again. Six, you are not interested in becoming close to your spouse emotionally or physically. Seven, when confronted about having feelings towards someone other than your spouse, you justify your actions to yourself and others. Why is it specified as an online friend? Because apparently that's the only way that people have affairs. (laughs) Wow. President Hinckley says selfishness is the reason for broken homes. This makes complete sense because one of the number one attributes for making a marriage work is unselfishness on the part of the spouse. As we've learned. There's a difference between sensual, slutty, and sleazy. (laughs) What? And elegant, beautiful, and sexy. And what is that difference? We'll never know. More information. We will never know. (laughs) Oh, look, more about the love languages. Oh. Challenges come to every marriage, no exceptions. Transitions to expect, conflict, money issues, parenting styles. Number one, pay your tithing. That's the answer to your marriage problems. Yep. Your, your money problems. Starts with tithing. Yep. Marriage provides you with a way to overcome your weaknesses. Don't be afraid of it. If you knew all the things that marriage can do for you, you would run to it with open arms Porn addiction. No. Uh, and of course, if you have real love and real commitment, you can work out any problem. It's real intent. Suicide. Looks like your options are divorce, suicide, and murder. Or change. Why are those the options? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's life in the box. I, I guess the box is marriage. And a lot of people feel low or miserable in that state. Uh-huh. Marital satisfaction is low. So you could get divorced, but you have to justify that choice. Or you could kill them. (laughs) Or you could kill yourself. And you are therefore in the box with them forever. 
because you you already got married for eternity, so divorce won't work. Uh huh. Suicide. No notes. <laughs> Three. Murder. Escape from doing the hard work of making the relationship work. Children need their emotional needs met. And of course, there's your church callings. <laughs> what? The, these, these ideas in succession, mm-hmm. they, they're not... Mm-hmm. Why, why? Or you could change. Oh. How about that? Why is suicide even I have no idea. included? Because suicide in... Because you're that miserable? In the church is not... Yeah. It's not an option. Right. I know. If you want to be in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Sure. Okay, so when we're in the miserable box, we don't see the whole person. We just see the problem. And we get hopeless about the problem. But what if the problem is so great that not being with the person is the answer to solving the problem? Not an option. But suicide or murder... Apparently, are? all the way out of the box is to want out to humble yourself and have a change of heart. Forgiveness is the answer to depression. Humble yourself. Oh, marriage isn't about fair. It's about doing the right thing. Wow. The right thing. Jesus. I'm a flat person and I'm going to marry a flat person. Is that a note to yourself? <laughs> um, I think that was said to us. A flat person? Uh Uh-huh. What does that mean? I really can't win. I'm flawed. I'm fallen. I don't see my weakness as my friend. I can't succeed without the atonement. We're all flat without Jesus. (laughs) Jesus pumps us up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How else can we become who we're supposed to be without working hard? You will literally kneel before the Savior. You will want to kneel before the idea of marriage and worship it. If it's who we're supposed to be, why would we have to work hard at all? There's three types of marriage, apparently. The first kind of marriage, both spouses are competing to win. These are the marriages that destroy. The second kind of marriage is ripe with winning and losing, but the roles are set and the loser is always the same spouse. These are truly abusive marriages. The third kind of marriage is not perfect, not even close, but a decision has been made and two people have decided to love each other to the limit and to sacrifice the most important thing of all themselves. Losing becomes a way of life. Oh, marriage is for losers. Losing becomes a way of life. Mm-hmm. Because you have to be so unselfish all the time. That's just so beautiful. Wow. Marriage is for losers. Marriage is for losers. <laughs> Marriage is for the people who sacrifice everything they've ever wanted in life. Maybe that's the title of the episode. Marriage is for losers. Yeah. Love it. Spencer Kimball wrote a book called Marriage and Divorce. President Kimball promises members of the church that they will have the marriages they desire if they will do the following four things. One, marry well. Two, practice great unselfishness. Great. Three, continue courting each other after marriage. Four, practice complete commitment to live the commandments. I mean, you shouldn't stop quoting each other after marriage. Sure. I would say. Sure. Continuing that pursuit of each other is healthy, I would say. I testify that if you will follow his counsel, your marriages will succeed and you will discover the love you want. Good luck in your future. Good luck. In 2012, I had Book of Mormon Part 2 English 101, Philosophy, Science, and Theater. In 2013, I had Art, American Foundations, Doctrine and Covenants, Part 1. Bunch of theater stuff. And the Book of Mormon classes and the Doctrine and Covenants classes are required? Yeah. I had to read a talk called Joseph Smith, an Apostle of Jesus Christ, and respond to it. Joseph Smith, an Apostle of Jesus Christ by Elder Dennis B. Neuenschwander of Mm -hmm. the 70. The end sign, January 2009. Okay. At first, when I read the title of the talk, I thought, Joseph Smith, an Apostle of Jesus Christ. That doesn't sound right. It's supposed to be Joseph Smith, a prophet of Jesus Christ. But then I understood once I read this. The sure witness of Christ's being and the reality of his resurrection is the first pillar of apostolic testimony. The second pillar is centered on the Savior's redemptive and saving power. How does the prophet Joseph Smith fit into these apostolic requirements? The answer is perfectly. 
Absolutely. I liked what Elder Newman Schwander, what a name, said <laughs> about Joseph's beginning searches for truth. Joseph's apostolic instruction began in 1820. Pondering the questions of religion, he soon found that there was no way to reason or argue one's opinion to an authoritative conclusion concerning the correctness of the various churches of their doctrines or their doctrines. It was a war of words and tumult of, of opinions. <laughs> Joseph's ministry, section 110. Joseph's answer became what we refer to today as the first vision, an incredibly personal and sacred experience, which over time... Illuminated by additional experience and instruction became the founding revelation of the Restoration. Elton Newen Schwander continues with a comparison between the vision received by Moses and the vision received by Joseph. Mm. Moses saw God's greatness first and then was confronted with the power of the adversary before being delivered from his influence. Joseph Smith, on the other hand, faced the adversary first and then was saved from his assault by the appearance of the father and son. Then... Joseph grew in great spiritual strength as he translated the Book of Mormon. Indeed, the Book of Mormon prophets employ over a hundred titles in their teachings of Christ, each of which helped Joseph understand the Savior's divine role. By virtue of these teachings, Joseph Smith became intimately acquainted with ancient prophets, giving him insight into the divine purpose of his responsibilities. The next level paragraphs are summed in this one. The first vision in the grove, the translation of the Book of Mormon, the revision of the Bible, the revelation of the Book of Moses, and the translation of the Book of Abraham laid the basic foundation of the church, largely through the rapidly expanding knowledge and testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith relating to Jesus Christ. The revelations compiled in the Doctrine and Covenants have blessed my life, all thanks to Joseph Smith. Our own testimonies of the Savior are framed by the testimony and teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. I am so grateful for my Savior and his servants. <laughs> She's so grateful. So grateful. I mean, what does that say about, as we were talking about, just how much power the quote-unquote adversary, Satan, yeah. has? That Aww. he had first dibs on influencing Joseph Smith yeah. before God himself and Christ his son appeared to him? Uh-huh. Why would he even have, if this was the whole plan, Yeah. which... Would, would be the case. If if the church needs to be restored and it's going to be Joseph Smith that does it, they can't show up first. They need to give Lucifer his shot at stopping him. Uh-huh. Of course, this would be the time to point out the many different versions of the first vision, of course. whether they include that bit of the adversary or not, or whether Jesus Christ was there or not, or Heavenly Father was there or not, or if it was Nephi if it was just a host of angels, if it was a pillar of fire. There's a lot of variety. Yeah. But we don't talk about that. We have our homogenized version, and that's it. General conference review. Ooh. The most important thing above my daily activities is my relationship with Heavenly Father. This talk impacted me greatly because it started me thinking about my acute awareness of my lack of spiritual nourishment as of late. I have not made sufficient time for scripture study, prayer journaling, the temple, and just acting on my faith in general. I suck. Basically. Or I'm just in school. Yeah. I am a bit busy. Yeah. Preoccupied. That was the year I was graduating. Mm. Our faith prepares us to be in the presence of God. I ask myself, can he rely on me? The distractions in my life seem to have shut him out. The desire to take time to be holy is there. But I just can't seem to grasp the devotion to the gospel that I desire. It just feels out of my reach. Am I drinking deeply and often from the fountain of living water? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that uh, some New Testament shit? Yeah. This is towards the end of my time at BYU Idaho. Mm-hmm. And I'm starting to get a little tired yeah. of living the gospel, if you will. Yeah. I've been on a mission. I've been at BYU Idaho for five years. I'm about to graduate. Five years including your mission, you mean? Uh, Yes. From the time you started? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I did nine semesters there. Yeah. Wow. By the end of it, I was like, I don't really want to be on this treadmill uh, anymore. Yeah. And I don't even have a husband. And I don't even have a husband. What was this all for? What the heck? I was too busy being in love with my... <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Cut that out. <laughs> Yikes. 
Sister Lisa, do you have anything else to dazzle us with before we close? Yeah, I'm just trying to make this sure episode. I've gone through all my dazzling jewels. <laughs> okay, there's a book of Mormon scriptures that says, Awake my soul, no longer droop in sin, rejoice in my heart, and give place no more for the enemy of my soul. And then I said, I was able to receive a temple recommend today from my bishop, and it oh. feels wonderful to know that I am a worthy young woman and that I am not defined by my sins. My mistakes do not define me. My potential does. Heavenly Father knows what I am capable of, and I am so grateful that I can be forgiven and know that he remembers my sins no more. I can rejoice like Nephi. My burdens can be lifted, and the light can fill my soul. My future is unlimited. Your first temple recommend? No. No? Just renewing it. Oh, okay. With my bishop on campus. Relief. You're not so bad that you're going to be denied. College was the only time that I was asked to not take the sacrament as punishment. Oh. For sinning. That was the only time that that bishop told me not to take the sacrament for a period of time. So that I could feel sufficiently shitty enough. And that everyone would know that I had committed that sin because I wasn't taking the sacrament. One of the most significant things I've been able to better understand this semester through this course, the Book of Mormon, has been the necessity to satisfy the demands of justice and the Savior's role in that. Without Him, we could not meet the demands of that unchanging law. There are rules that even God must abide by. We don't just make them all up here on earth. We would not be able to be redeemed from the fall and return to live with Heavenly Father in the celestial kingdom if the demands of justice were not met. We cannot do that ourselves but we would still have had to suffer the consequences without the Savior making an intercession. There are laws that even God must abide by? Yeah, like the laws of justice. But they would come from him. No. No? No. Where would they come from? They just exist. Like God didn't create good and evil. They already just exist. No, that that makes no sense. But that's how it is. <laughs> Remember, because he's not the only God. Oh, Elohim, yeah. Yeah. I know my Savior lives. I am grateful for his atonement. It is real, and I have tasted of its goodness. And that's it. And I know it. That's all I can find. And I absolutely know it. Try to put yourself, your consciousness back in this brain mm-hmm. almost 10 years ago. Yeah. How much you're thinking about what Heavenly Father thinks. And wants and yeah. has planned for you. Mm-hmm. And how little you think about that now. And how much you think about what you want. Oh my God. I think about it so much. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so grateful I don't have this as the criteria by which to decide yeah. if what I'm doing is good enough. Yeah. Thank God. Ironically. Yeah. Thank God. Ironically, thank God. Well, any revelations you've had listening to me spew nonsense? <laughs> revelations? Not quite. Well, Gratitude. We know what revelation is now yeah. after this. I did think, and I, I, maybe I didn't say it, I am glad that I didn't have this type of experience, that I didn't go yeah. to a church college. As we've talked about, I didn't go on, on my mission. Sure. And I didn't have this sort of discourse and coercion. Oh, wow. I can't imagine Poisoning of the well. Yeah, of course not. No. Thankfully, I, yeah, I was not primed for that. No. I I would have had a bad time. Yep. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) But how will you know what the red flags are? How will you know who to marry? I mean... You can't hurry, love. You just have to wait. And, you know, dating and is- And love a, don't come easy. Exactly. It's and a game of give and take. Dating is a <laughs> game played on the basis of mutual deception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we've learned anything. Amen to that. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to have re-educated myself. That's interesting. I can say, looking back on this now- that I've taken the time to at least replace all of this. Mm -hmm. I don't know everything, but I know enough to dispute and correct, if you Mm -hmm. will, this nonsense. That's really cool. Yeah. 
I read some different books that weren't yeah. written by Spencer read, W. Kimball. I read some other books. <laughs> and okay. Joseph Smith. Yeah. I read some other books. <laughs> Many of which we've talked about on this podcast. We'll have to do another <gasps> book report! Book report! <laughs> I uh, I think I'm like 65, 70% through No Man Knows My History. Wow. I don't think, I don't think there's anything in there that really warrants like a, a book report on that because mm-hmm. it's, it's such a wellspring for what you and I have both researched that most of it isn't, most of the information isn't new, but the way she writes it. It's really well presented. It's obviously very well researched. And it's obviously solid because even Richard Bushman writing Rough Stone Rolling uses it as a reference point, her research. Yeah. It hasn't taken me so long to read it because it's not easy to read. It's actually very easy to read. Mm -hmm. I just don't give enough time for reading lately. Yeah. I feel like my fervor for researching stuff like that is really... That it is also waning for me. Gone into the background. Yeah. I've been like listening to other books. Mm-hmm. I would have finished it by now if there was an audiobook version of it, which I think some people have endeavored or at least proposed like it, there should be. Uh-huh. As far as I know, there still isn't, which is kind of weird. It's weird. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. I mean, I think our psyche is needed to grab on to all the information that we could mm-hmm. in that process of deconstructing, but feel like I'm at a place now where I am more interested in What's other, beyond? other walks of life. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I got ahead of myself in collecting books on the subject because I have behind me <laughs> at least half a dozen books on Mormonism <laughs> that I don't know if I'm going to want to read yeah. actually anymore. Mm. But they're there. Time will tell. Yeah, we'll see. You have the option. Yeah. And that's probably, okay. That's all right. That's fine. Yeah. They look good. Oh, they look good. Oh, they look good. <laughs> wow. Well, have a good time editing this. Thank you very much. It's not as long as the other other it, one. It'll right? be about the same. It'll be about the same. Okay, Ultimately, well, yeah. let's wrap it up so we can watch my Birbiglia. Yeah. What's it called? The Old Man in the Pool? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, it's all about ruminating on death. We love that. All right. Well, this has been great. That was a great way to end it. I'm Brother Dan. I'm Sister Lisa. Thank you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.